starting the last section in design experiments as we are closing the section all. And today's section is really on how you make money from experiments. So the response surface methods is really where you start to move away from the makes. So far in this part of the course we at just working around a certain factorial plus or minus one. Today we're going to start moving away from that plus or minus one and explore different parts of the space around us. But to do that, we need to know which direction to move in, and that's what response surface methods tell us, is how to move to that optimum. And if we're moving to that optimum in the most efficient direction, this is why I call the section how you may keep the most money because you're going to climb this mountain, reach this optimum, and you can use the other experiments. So let's just uh, point out one thing, RSM. You only do RSM once you've figured out what your important variables are. Okay, so those important factors may have considered initially we've got six factors. Of those six factors, you discover only three are important. It's only those three important factors that you go do your response with this method. There's no reason to go ahead and consider the other three factors that you figured out are not important. They don't affect why too much. So what this response with this method focuses on is the important factors. So it assumes that you've already done a set of experiments figure that out. And what I'm going to talk about today and in the next class is that the response of this method is a sequence of experiments. Now let's be very careful. I started this section by telling you that sequential experiments should never be done. So we started at today's case, remember we moved left and right here, we found our optimum was at point number three, and then we decided to vary this vertical variable substrate concentration and we landed up at our pseudo-optimum, that final point there. And so that was a sequence of seven, eight experiments. Now this question, what I'm talking about today is we're going to do a cluster of experiments, four or five experiments, then find a direction to move it. We're going to move in that direction, repeat another cluster of experiments, and then move to approach the optimum. So it is sequential, but it's groups of sequential experiments. And of course, the very first set of experiments that you've done already, as I point out here, you've already done a group of experiments simply to figure out what are your important factors, i.e., this is a fractional factorial. This may be a very heavily saturated factorial that you've already done, and use that saturated factorial to figure out what your important factors are. Now you're going to move around. So let's see how we do this. Well, let's give a bit of history here. The person that figured this all out for us was George Marx. George Marx passed away um, about this time last year, which was interesting that as I was teaching this material, uh, this happened. Um, so let's talk about George Marx. George Marx was one of the most influential statisticians that lived. He was the supervisor of Mike uh, Marx. John McGregor, and John McGregor's supervisor, he supervised his master's and his PhD thesis. Um, George Marx is also most famous for a whole variety of quotes, but one that gets used most frequently is essentially all models are used are wrong, but some are useful. And that's what we're going to use exactly that quote today. Let's see how that applies. So George Marx said that if you want to approach the optimum, the response of this method, you need to climb the mountain. How do we do that? I'll show what you do in one variable and generalize to many variables. Now, let's be clear that usually experiments have more than one factor. But let's consider what happens. Let's presume you've got this very fortunate situation that when you've figured out what your important factors are, you find you only have one factor. Okay, so let's call that A, for example. That's almost never going to be the case. You almost certainly have more than one factor. But if you have this very fortunate situation of one factor, you vary it as follows. Let's take a look here. We start at this point, 
that you send to work, and you do two experiments. You do an experiment at low level of A and a high level of A. So that for Y0 minus Y0 plus, so low A, high A. And what you do essentially with those two data points is that you find measuring in on the black curve. The black curve now is the truth. You don't know the truth. Ever. But at least by doing those two experiments, you can get those two data points on the black curve. And what you say is, well, I can see that the direction where y is increasing is over to the right. So let me keep moving over to the right. And how much do I move over to the right? Well, one way to tell is to draw a horizontal curve, a line that passes simply through the two data points. That's my tangential curve. There's your first model. All models are wrong, but they are useful. That blue curve is wrong. It's not the truth of the situation. The true situation is the black curve. The blue model is wrong, but it's useful. It's telling you at the very least which direction you should move in. You should move over to the right. So let's do exactly that. We take a step of gamma 1 units over to the right. Gamma 1 units, we plot over there and we add at i equals 1. Do one more experiment. I do one more experiment and record that point y1, that black point. Now I have three data points. What I do is I simply say at this point, well look, what happened here? I predicted that I should have had a value there on the blue line. I got a value that's on the black curve. They're not much different. So to my mind, that blue curve still continues going. I can still keep marching along the blue curve. Again, all models are wrong, but they're still useful. It's still telling me I should keep going to the right. When I do that, I jump another step, gamma 2, that at an i equals 2, repeat my experiment, and I get y2. Now, this is the point where you can have two choices in the road. You can either stop and say, well, hang on, I predicted the point of I got a point that's a little bit lower, much lower than I expected. And based on that, you may decide to refit your wrong model. You may decide using these one, two, three, four data points to fit a spline or quadratic. Okay, so you go back to Dr. Adams' notes in 3E, e, show you how to fit that spline and that quadratic. You can fit a spline that will almost perfectly fit that black curve. <coughs> Or you can say, well, I'm too lazy, I'm just going to keep going. And you go along the blue curve, you further still to y3, and you land at this point. And now you realize, well, wait a second, y2 is over here. I predicted the value at that third point. It should have been up there. I got one that was pretty low. In fact, it's about the same value as y2. So now you realize that your laziness didn't pay off. You probably should have fit that quadratic value or that spline. But let's say you really don't want to dig out your 3D nodes and you insist on fitting linear models. You can still fit that linear model by running an experiment to the left and the right, and you refit another wrong model. So fit another blue model. This time you've got a slope that's in the opposite direction. It's a negative slope, telling you that you should head over to the left. So you can take another leap, this time down to four. You don't want to keep going. You don't want to go all the way back here, of course, because then you're using the land of Y2. So you take a step over to the left of the mountain gap of 4, and you can call it a day. If you know that you're optimum somewhere in this region, and you can stop. So you use two models, this blue line over here, and the second blue line over there. Both models are wrong, both are useful. They served exactly the goal that they were intended for, which is to help you find the optimum. This is one thing that you have been used to now in your career. You've been learning in first year, second year, third year, fourth year, all these beautiful theoretical models, and you believe that they're so true, they're actually not. Okay. In many cases, the models we've learned about in our undergrad are simple approximations with large amounts of error. We have to get used to that. We have to get used to and be able to, willing to say, stop, this model is okay, it's telling me the right trends, but precision isn't quite right. And being able to tell when your model is not useful anymore is an important skill. Let's take a look at how we can do that on this example. How do 
how can you tell when your model is not useful anymore? Well, it was exactly when you were at y2, you predicted a point up there, but you got a point down there. Right there, you know your model is not so useful anymore. And when you ran y3, you predicted a point way up there, you got a point far down here. That's a second confirmation your model isn't useful anymore. It's time to go refit and build a more complex model that approximates reality. Okay, so is that thinking clear there univariate? Any questions on that univariate single variable example? Okay, so now we're going to take it up to two variables. Let's see the same idea of being able to figure out when our model is still okay versus when it's not okay is what we need to apply to two variables. How do we do that? Well, we're going to follow exactly the same approach. We're going to optimize until the model is inadequate, and then we're going to rebuild that, that model. And here's what I want you to think. It's a pretty crude analogy, but it's absolutely accurate. If you were a blind person, if you had a cane, you would need to use that cane to detect what the shape and the topography of the environment is around you. So if I was blind and I was trying to climb up these stairs, I'd use my cane to figure out where each step is. <coughs> Now, we're going to do, do exactly that. We're going to be like a blind person, and we want to climb non-linear, complex slopes. We want to climb slopes that look something like this. This is an example from Reactor Design 3K, where they were optimizing the methanol yield. So two of you took the 3K with me uh, last year. We were optimizing the methanol yield when we were changing pressure and temperature in the reactor. There's a non-linear surface that tells me where my optimum is. Now, if I were a blind person down here, and I want to reach the optimum in the fewest number of steps, I use my cane, and I touch at certain points on that slope, and I can find the direction of steepest rate of climb, steepest descent. And I can quickly land up at that peak over there, or over there, I'm not sure anymore which one is the highest, I think this one closest to us is the highest peak. I can quickly climb this hill and land over there. The analogy is that every time you put that cane down, it costs a lot of money. A single time to touch the ground might cost $200,000. Or it might cost a million dollars. Or it might cost as, as cheap as $10. Either way, there's a cost associated with every tap you take. And you want to take the fewest number of taps get to your optimum so that you can do it in the fewest amount of possible. So that's, that's the way that you need to think about it. And if you put your cane down and tap and the ground is higher than what you expected, you know that something has changed underneath your feet. If you're climbing this hill and you're walking along here, you're tapping and it's nice and flat, then suddenly you tap over there and you're like, okay, something has changed to rebuild this mental model that you have. The ground isn't linear anymore. Now let's presume you're climbing the hill and you're tapping and the slope keeps going exactly where you're expecting and suddenly you climb over the hill and you tap and the slope is much lower than where you anticipated. You know that things are starting to head down the line. So we're going to build mental models in our mind of what the surface looks like try and climb up that hill in the fastest way. Let's see how we do this. Here's an example that we're going to use, and I'm telling you where the future is. The optimum is right there. We don't know that. So how do we get to that optimum in the fewest number of steps? Now, the example you have in the notes in front of you is wrong. It's been wrong for five years, and I keep using it incorrectly every year I teach the course for a good reason. So let's take a look at how we should do this. We're starting over here in this corner. This is where we've always operated the process. And we're trying to optimize our system. We're trying to get a slightly better profit. Profit is my Y variable. Profit is always a very good Y variable. If you're never sure what your Y variable should be, it likely should be profit. Profit is a great Y variable because it combines both income and costs in one objective number. Profit is income minus costs, so you 
doing both maximizing income and minimizing costs at the same time with one objective function. So if you've ever stuck for a good y variable, profit is likely going to be here. So we're going to maximize profit. And at the moment, where we're operating, we're making profit on the order of 400 bucks a day. It's so not a whole lot of money. Let's see how we can improve that. Well, we've got two a factorial experiment. We've got two variables. We've figured out our two important factors already. Our temperature, T on the horizontal axis, and substrate concentration on the vertical axis. This is a bioreactor system A. So we want to improve that profit by varying both T and S. Now the first thing to go do is do a factorial in T and S. And we've chosen a lower level of 320 Kelvin and 330 Kelvin as the upper level of temperature. How did I pick those two? What might have been some of the ways I figured out what those bounds should be?
first model look like? Company coefficients. More coefficients, how many data points? Five data points, more coefficients. So our least squares model might look something on the form y equals p mod some heat percent plus the effect of temperature dt xt plus the substrate effect plus the temperature substrate interaction. So that would be my least squares model. Any estimates for B0?
So P0 can be calculated as, as the sum of those five terms divided by five, and you get a value of 390. So for P0, we divide by five. So why do we only divide by four for P and S? Because the zeros there in the X transpose X matrix don't, don't add extra rows. So here's, here's your homework. You're all confused. X, go set up the X matrix, go set up the Y vector, calculate X transpose X, X transpose X inverse, prove to yourself has fours on the diagonal and the five elements on the, on the corresponding intersect. You have to prove this to yourself. There's no, no way that I do basic algebra in this course. Your fourth year final year students. So please go set that up. In fact, I've given you an assignment question that previously. I'm expecting you to know this stuff by now. So there's my there's my B squares model. Where do I run my next experiment? To improve confidence. Probably right. Up and to the right. Let's take a look at one final plot that we should always consider. And that's our Q plot. And there's a neat trick that you can apply to a Q-plot in two dimensions to help figure this out. So there's my Q-plot, and I'm writing the temperature on the low, on the horizontal axis, substrate on the vertical axis. And we've got 320 and 330 over here corresponding to my low and high levels, and that would be plus 1 and minus 1. On my substrate axis, I've got minus 1 and plus 1, and in real world units, that corresponds to 0 0.5 and 1.0 gram per meter. So there's my coded units on the left, my, my real world units on the right. In this notation down here, I've got my, my real world units in Kelvin my coded units corresponds to minus one and plus one. Very important understanding that we're developing in today's class is the mapping between coded units and real world units. We do all our work, all our optimization in coded units, and we have to talk with our colleagues in real world units. When we tell our operator to do the next experiment, we have to tell our operator to do the experiment in real world units. I'm going to tell you how to do the next experiment at plus 1, plus 0 0.5. That doesn't mean much, so we need to be able to move seamlessly between the two sets of, of um, symbols. So let's take a look at what, what happened here in our experiment. My baseline is 407. So there's my baseline, 407. My first experiment was here at 193. The second experiment, 310. Next one was 468, and then finally 571. Okay, so that notion of running up to the right is correct, but exactly which angle do I run up? Do I run up perfectly 90 degrees? Do I run up at 45? Which direction do I go? Between 25 and 90. Kyle? We find the slopes. Divide the slopes. Okay, so here's how you climb a mountain in the fewest steps. You climb the mountain, which way to the car contour lines? Parallel with the contour lines? Perpendicular. Okay. The fastest way up the mountain is perpendicular to the contour lines. Where's the contours here? So here's the neat, the neat thing we can do with the Q plot. Let's add some contour lines to them. You can start at any corner. I like to just start here, for example. There's 468. On this side over here, where's 468? Uh, 
Okay, so 468 would be somewhere around there here. Between 407 and 571, where's 468? Somewhere over there. 468, a little bit closer to this one than to that one, okay? So we're going to put a line between 468, this fictitious 468, and that fourth fictitious. There's my first contour line. Let's take 407 next. 407 is over here. Where's 407? Somewhere along this line. It's over here. There's 407. And then 407 also exists somewhere over here. Remember, contour lines are lines of equal height. So we find those same values. 310 exists over here. 310 exists somewhere on this diagonal as well, between 407 and 193. And 310 exists on this vertical axis over here on the left. So it's about over there. Okay, so you can usually draw at least three contour lines on a cube plot to get you an idea of the shape of the surface. The direction of steepest descent, as, as, as you mentioned, is the direction that's perpendicular. So we simply go 90 degrees up, and that's where I want to head. Let's do that mathematically now. So that is a very rough approximation, but George Box would say all models are wrong, that, but it's not useful. That's a useful idea of the direction I want to go in. What's mathematically a little bit more accurate? Well, let's go take a look at that. Through a little bit more mathematically accurate, I can say, I want to climb up that mountain, up this mountain, and this mountain has a slope of y equals 390 plus 55 plus 134 xx. I'm going to drop the two-factor interaction. The two-factor interaction, remember, was a very small number of negative three and a half. So this is a slope, sorry, this is an equation, I should say, that tells me what my slopes are. Now, we can derive what that perpendicular direction is. <coughs> that perpendicular direction can be derived, but I'm going to simply state for you, without proof, that the direction you want to climb in has the following relationship, that the change in x divided by a change in t is equal to the slope coefficient in s divided by the slope coefficient in t. It's not a difficult proof. It's simply, if you want to prove it yourself, you can go find the equation for these contour lines and then find the perpendicular to it. Remember, the perpendicular has, has a direction that's the inverse negative of the slope. So it's a simple geometrical calculation, but that's the end result. Now, let's be clear here. What we're saying is that this is the change in S divided by the change in T, but those are the change in coded units. They're not the change in real world units, that's the change in coded units. This model was built in coded units. So, just one final thing. Bs, the, the slope coefficient for S is 134, and Bt is the 55. So that's what I'm referring to as Bt and the S over there. So it's telling me that for every one unit increase I make in T, I need to make a 134 over 55 unit increase in S. Or another way to say that here, if you want to write this down, move up by 134 units in XS, 
for every 55 units in Xt. Delta XT 
speed by one unit. So where's my next experiment going to be along this horizontal axis? So delta xt is one unit. That's a five Kelvin increase relative to the baseline. So there's my baseline, that's my zero, zero point. So we're going to make a one unit increase in xt. We're going to go up by five Kelvin in that direction. So my next point is going to be somewhere over there. So I'm expecting a value of 330 Kelvin for my fifth experiment and some value of substrate concentration that's put in that area. Let's see how much it is exactly.
So the change in substrate concentration then is a 0.61 grams per liter increase in delta S actual. And similarly to what I did here before, I can find that S5, which is equal to S0 plus delta S actual, is equal to my base case, my baseline, which is at 0.75 plus 0.61 So my next experiment that I tell my operator to run is at 1.36 grams per liter. So the two values I tell my operator to use for the next, for the fifth experiment are 330 Kelvin and 1.36 grams per liter in real world units. And we can verify that that makes rough Rough sense over there, there's my plus one in temperature, and there's the plus point, uh, sorry, the 1.36 grams per liter is over there. So in that direction, that matches the So what I'd like you to do for next class is, before we even run that experiment, predict for me what the confidence is going to be at that experiment. Before the operator does the work, then predict what the confidence is going to be. That's how we're going to tell our models.